session. Uh, it looks like Somaya was not able to come online. So we have uh, several talks on this uh, science instrumentation and data. The first one being, uh, from Ancarni Romero, and he's in fact uh, online. So I uh, invite uh, him, him, right? To, to to give his talk and you have her. no sorry i invite her sorry <laughs> <laughs> and you have the those uh, how much don't you have 12 minutes plus okay. the three minutes for discussion just go ahead can you see my screen yes indeed oh, no, no. no not yet okay that's fine now that's good and the sounds good okay cool okay well thank you everybody for coming to this presentation. I thought I'd give an update. There's quite a lot happening on SALT um, of the last year or so. And so I thought I'd give an update at AFAS and keep everyone updated. So my name is Encarni Romero Colmenero. I'm the head of SALT Astronomy Operations. Um, and um, for some reason, not, not it's, my screens are not moving. Okay, here we go. Okay, so um, what is SALT? SALT is a um, telescope that was built by a partner institutions. Um, the um, logos of the various institutions are shown here. And it's essentially accessed only for PIs in those partner institutions. And of course, with a lot of collaborators from all over the world. And also lately through groups that buy SALT time. So like the ORP and then soon NOILAB through the Vera Rubin Observatory are also getting time on SALT. Um, African collaborations are encouraged. Um, and so please contact us if you'd like to get in touch and do some research with, um, with SALT. And we also have some open time on DDT of a few hours per semester. Um, the email address is there. Um, so there's different ways in which you can access SALT. Where is it? The headquarters are in Cape Town. Um, at the location where the conference is being hosted right now, the South African Astronomical Observatory in Observatory. Uh, but the actual telescope is in Sutherland. Why in Sutherland? Uh, Sutherland is in the middle of the Karoo. Um, it's a semi-arid Karoo region that doesn't have strong variability, um, so very weather dependency, seasonal weather dependencies. Um, it's got very dark sky among the darkest in the world. And um, unfortunately, the scene is, is more median um, of about 1.4 arc second on the median. It's not as good, but it's a very, very dark site. As an image of the telescope, um, that um, is an 11 meter primary mirror array um, of um, 91 segmented one meter meters, sorry, one meter mirrors. And they're held together with edge sensors that they keep the primary mirror aligned for over a week, um, sometimes if, if there's nothing happening more than two weeks. The key point about salt that, that is fixed in altitude. So um, we have to essentially wait for the earth to rotate and objects to come into the visibility annulus. That means um, that is fully Q scheduled and we generally have pools of optional targets all over the sky. That tends to be the most efficient observing for us. Um, the good nice, good, nice point about it is that all of the instruments on SALT are available at all times. So there's no seasons um, and it's been regular operations since 2011. Um, how long we can observe objects in the sky will depend mainly on where, where in the sky they are in, according to their deck. So it can go from several hours in the south um, to just uh, nearly under an hour in the east or the west, um, depending. Um, the other important aspect about using salt with a fixed altitude is that um, there's a tracker at the top that casts uh, vignetting onto the primary mirror. Um, and that central obscuration kind of moves as the tracker tracks the object through the sky as the earth rotates. Um, and that means essentially that since your effective area is changing with time, we cannot do absolute photometry with salt. You need um, you can do relative photometry, but for absolute photometry, you need um, another telescope or some other source of information like catalogs in order to do that. Mm -hmm. What instrumentation we have on SALT? Um, we have um, our acquisition and imaging camera, SALTICAM. It's an imager of an eight arc minute field of view. Um, it's blue sensitive down to 320 nanometers. It's got a wide range of filters. 
um, and it's got um, high time resolution photometry down to 50 millisecond uh, mm -hmm. photometry. Um, it's an aging instrument. Unfortunately, the observations are currently unguided and we are looking for a replacement still being considered at the moment. Um, um, the Robis Dobby spectrograph, the main workhorse of the instrument for dark nights and good weather um, is our long slit and multi-object spectrograph uh, with a media resolution of R to about up to 10,000, depending on um, your wavelength range and the grating you use. Um, it has um, other multiple capabilities like fabric pro imaging spectroscopy, which is currently not available, but it's being refurbished. And please see Liz's talk right after mine about the plans for the fabric pro system. Uh, we also have polarimetric and spectropolarimetric modes, um, which are widely used by the community. And just like Salticam, high time resolution with about 100 milliseconds spectroscopy um, and 50 milliseconds um, also on, on photometry. And that's kind of like our main Swiss army knife of everything you want to do with this thing, you, you can, basically. Um, a high resolution spectrograph in a shell in three, well, it has four modes, low resolution, medium resolution, and high resolution modes in, um, of fiber fed. And the high stability mode, which has the same resolution of the, as the high resolution, but it's got the highest wavelength accuracy. So it goes down to about three to five meters per second with using either our iodine cell or thorium argon for calibrations. Uh, but we are getting a laser frequency com um, for calibrations coming up. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, and this is now the workhorse instrument for salt during the full moons and we're seeing. It also has a fully data reduced pipeline um, that makes it very convenient to use. So how does SALT work? Well, we have two calls for proposals per year. The deadlines are the end of January and then the end of July. PIs are allocated time, and then they split it into observing blocks. And then those are submitted into our queue. The blocks are reviewed by the SALT astronomers for technical purpose, potential problems, and then added to the queue. They can be submitted at any time. They can be sub submitted independently. And um, that means they make SALT very efficient for TOOs. Um, it can be observed, followed up very quickly. And the other important difference from main teles other telescopes, large telescopes, is that our queue stays, the blocks stay in the queue until either they are observed according to the requirements by the APIs and accepted, or the semester expires. So when uh, we allocate time, it's actually observing time. Um, so it's, there's no uh, losing your night due to bad weather. Um, you will just try again tomorrow night. What happens to the salt data? It's been transferred to Cape Town immediately after being observed, pipelined in the morning, and PIs are notified by email, normally the following morning, um, but you can even access raw data as it's taken if needed. Uh, we have a very efficient and responsive salt helpline, um, and we also um, have the data in a data archive which when it becomes public, it's searchable and um, relatively easy to use. Some recent updates on SALT, as I was saying. Um, so for those of you that know about SALT, uh, we were considering having mini trackers. So that was adding extra trackers, um, kind of like little octopus legs attached to the main tracker that would be doing carrying out their own observations while the tracker was doing its own. Um, that actually was a very successful study and it's technically feasible. Uh, the only downside is um, that now, now it comes to a point where you really do have to figure out the impact on the telescope and, and your return for, for price, because it's not a cheap thing to do. We're currently very busy with many other updates. And so the, the plan has currently been parked for the time being. Um, and we will review within a year or two once major or our major updates that are coming up now have, are out of the way. Um, so one of those things that are currently happening is our RSS, our main spectrograph is undergoing improvements. So it's getting some optic replacements and that will improve both the throughput and the stray light. We're getting some new long slits for faster acquisitions, um, a new grating um, that uh, will allow us to 
observe um, the entire optical spectrum with one, one image. New monolithic detector, which is expected to arrive mid next year sometime. Um, currently, our detectors has three chips and so two gaps, and it makes it um, very inefficient so that the new detectors coming up. And as I mentioned, the MR and the LR etalons for Fabri Perot are being refurbished, but I'll let Liz talk about that. Another exciting news is that the, um, we have a near infrared spectrograph that's coming from Wisconsin with an IFU and that's currently being shipped now as we speak. As we speak, it's, it's all packed and ready to go, waiting for the ship to take it out. It's expected to arrive late April. Um, and then um, it will be assembled at the telescope and on Sky Commission in beginning mid to 2022, so around June, July 2022. Um, takes the wavelength range up to 1700 nanometers. And it currently has a single grating. It has capability for more than one grating, uh, but it, it will come for the, with a single grating with an R of around two to 5,000. Um, this is what the IFU looks like on sky. This is a 10 arc minute field of view um, of salt, a standard, our standard finding chart, if you're familiar with salt. And that's what the IFU looks like um, with the object fiber and the sky fiber bundle. And zoomed in, you can see the fiber diameters are about 1.3 arc seconds. And the science bubble bundles 29 by 18 arc seconds on sky. Um, some more updates. So you might have heard about the Intelligent Observatory for the South African Astronomical Observatory. So SALT is part of the big Intelligent Observatory project in which the entire plateau will be operating intelligently and following up on alerts. So they can either do classical observations, they can do remote observations, they'll be able to do remote re robotic observations. And some of those alerts will be automatically fed to the SALT queue uh, by LSST or VRO or by whatever alert system you may want to trigger. And then your blocks will be submitted, observed and feedback will be provided. So SALT is being integrated in the Intelligent Observatory. Um, we're also having currently being built a new simultaneous red arm for RSS. So that's for our spectrograph. Um, if you're familiar with SALT, you might have heard referred to it as MAXI. Now it's RSS red. Um, and it will allow um, the full entirely optical range of 320 to 950 nanometers to be observed in one fell swoop um, with uh, the two monolithic, monolithic detectors, one for the red, one for the blue. We're expecting this to arrive in about two years. Um, and for the red part, the resolution's gonna be greater than 2000 um, so that we can accurately subtract, subtract the skylines. And as I mentioned, we're also in the process of acquiring a laser frequency comb. It's going to be, well, the, laser, the laser's already in the lab and the equipment is currently being purchased. And we're hoping that it will arrive here towards the end of the year um, for the high stability mode. So this will allow us to do full high precision um, radial velocity studies for exoplanet science, one to three meters per second. Um, and we are also commissioned the a fully automatic rated reduction pipeline. So which we're also expecting to, um, to come online roughly around the same time. Um, and we're also having a SALT workshop to discuss how to use SALT, well, how to add um, various um, aspects of tips and tricks and optimizing observations, et cetera, on SALT planned for the end of the year. So watch this space. And that's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ankarni. You are right on, the, on time, in fact. And we yeah. can give you the, your full three minutes of discussion, question and answers. You have been able, to, in fact, to give us a great, uh, exciting uh, new, uh, new developments at, 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 uh, which are coming at uh, SALT and also this uh, idea of uh, intelligent observatory projects. So that's a great thing. So I open the floor for discussion here from the, in the room where I am. Or otherwise, from the chat. So, please, uh, any comment, any question you want to address to Ankarni, please uh, feel so. No. Okay, let's see on the chat if there is anything, uh, any question. I don't see anything specific. So, 
We'll have to thank you again, Ankarni, for this uh, great uh, updates, and we hope that it will carry on new developments uh, for for African for, for South African astronomy and African astronomy. Okay, yes. thanks again. So we should thank you. Yes. Next speaker is Elizabeth uh, Nalumin Zar, also from SAO, and she will be speaking about one specific uh, great uh, uh, instrument there, the Salt RSS Fabri Perrault. So go ahead, uh, Elizabeth, you have 12 minutes and then three minutes for question and answer. Okay. Thank you very much, Jamal. So I'm just going to share my screen right now. Uh, can you confirm to me that you are seeing my screen? Uh, yes, indeed. All right, thank you very much. So my name is Elizabeth Nalumisa. I am a postdoc at SAO, and I'm going to speak specifically about the Fabri Perot Observing Mode, the project of which I am a part on SALT. So I'll first of all introduce spectroscopy and 3D spectroscopy before I go into the details of the SALT Fabri Perot. Uh, optical spectroscopy enables us to do measurements of composition, uh, the compositions of objects that of our interest. And we get to look to study the radio velocities, rotational velocities, elemental abundances, temperatures, and several aspects of the objects which we are interested in. However, with traditional spectroscopy, we only get a one dimensional view of the objects that we are interested in. In order to get the spatial information together with the 1D spect spectra, we have to then make extra observations, imaging observations of these objects. This is where 3D spectroscopy comes to the rescue. 3D spectroscopy enables us to simultaneously obtain the one dimensional spectra as well as the 2D spatial information, okay? So in essence, it gives us a data cube which has three axes, the X and Y giving us the spatial information as well as a third axis that gives us the spectral information. That means that th when you step through your cube, um, just to confirm, is everyone seeing the transitions in my slides? You can look at, you can see the cube? Yes. Yeah. Good. When you step through the cube at any channel of your, of your cube, you're able to extract an image that corresponds to the wavelength at that particular point in the cube, as well as at any pixel in your image, you're able to extract a spectrum that corresponds to that part of your, of your observation, okay? So the different methods that are used for 3D optical spectroscopy include integral field units, which can be fibers, lens slits, image slicers, or they can be, um, or you can use Fabry Perot interferometers. Uh, SALT has had a Fabry Perot, the Fabry Perot, Fabry Perot interferometry system. Uh, and as Inkani said in her previous in the previous talk, uh, the NIR with an IFU is on its way coming. So what exactly is a Fabry Perot interferometer? It's basically based on, on the Fabry Perot etalon, the standard etalon, which is made of two glass plates, which two parallel glass plates, and their inner surfaces are coated with reflective coatings, while their outer surface, surfaces are coated with anti-reflective coatings. Okay, on the right is an image of one of our old etalons showing the two glass plates. And when you want to operate the etalon in an interferometer mode, you either vary the gas pressure between the plates while keeping the separation constant, or you vary the actual physical separation of the plates. The etalons and salts are all variable plate separation etalons, and they are housed in a housing or in a cell that looks just like this image on the lower, lower left. Uh, so the joints that you see between the glass plates, they are controlled by piezoelectric actuators, which control the spacing, which is the Z that you see in the lower image, the tip and the tilt, which is the X and Y, in order to maintain the exact, exact parallelism of the plates, while changing the spacing. So this is what the light setup would look like. When light from a source hits the, the, the surface of the etalon, it is transmitted into the space between the two glass plates, undergoes multiple reflections before it is transmitted and focused onto a detector. 
The resulting fringe system or interf interference uh, pattern is a ring system where each ring represents an order of interference. And this is according to the interference equation, such that M is the order of interference, lambda is the transmitted wavelength, D is the plate separation, and theta is the angle of incidence. So whenever you change the spacing between the plates, you are changing the, the lambda or the wavelength that is being transmitted. On the lower right is an actual fringe pattern or interference pattern obtained um, at salt from one of our calibration lamps. And it shows you the transmitted, uh, the transmitted fringe pattern. And from, the, from, from that, you clearly see the peak, the wavelength of peak transmission varies with the radius, okay? Varies the radius such that for every step in your cube, as you're scanning along wavelength, you are going to get a spherical surface per se in wavelength space, okay? So your wavelength varies as in this picture from the center to the outwards of the, of the edge, outwards to the edge of that image, okay? However, also as you step through wavelength in order to obtain your cube, also your transmitted central wavelength is changing. In effect, in wavelength, you, you end up with a cube which has conical surfaces. Okay, of constant wavelength. And this is the kind of calibration cube that you would have to use to calibrate your data for wavelength. Now, I usually get this question, so let me answer it before I, before I get it again. Your data are going to look like normal images. It's just that you will have to calibrate them in order to obtain data fidelity. So this is an example of, of science that has been done before using the salt fabric payroll imaging mode. And it's, it's, it's been used for distribution studies because you can get spatial information, uh, kinematic studies, uh, you can obtain rotation curves, velocity fields, uh, dispersion velocities. And this can be done for wide, wide fields because first of all, RSS uh, has a very wide field of view. And for the fabric payroll, what you get in your entrance aperture that entire image, you'll be able to get spectra for that, for all the pixels in that image. So you can use it to study gas flows, nebulae, as well as large scale star formation in nearby uh, galaxies, resolved star formation studies, in other words. So a few technical details to keep in mind when you're dealing with, with the fabric payroll are one, the free spectral range, which is the separation between two orders of interference, uh, the full width half maximum, and very critical is the finesse. Now, the finesse is a tell of the quality of your etalon. High finesse, high quality. Very low finesse, not so good quality. So now the finesse uh, is ideally measured as reflectance finesse. However, there's effective finesse, which is the actual practical finesse because your, your performance or the performance of your etalon will be affected by any defects within the plates or any apparent, even apparent defects. It could be physical defects or apparent defects, as I'll speak later on, just briefly. So the practical finish can be measured as a ratio of the free spectral range to the full width at half maximum, whereas the reflectance finish is, is a function of the reflectivity of the reflective coatings in the inner surfaces. So you want very highly reflective coatings because um, this is a plot uh, to, il to illustrate this. The higher your reflectivity, the higher your finish will be. Now, even besides being in theory that, you know, according to this equation, your, that your higher reflectivity surfaces will give you higher finish. Also practically when you obtain your spectra, or your fringes, okay, you're going to have smaller full width half maximum and larger FSR, meaning your when you have higher reflective coatings, you're also increasing your chances of higher uh, practical finish or effective finish. So also resolving power will inform you of what kind of studies you can do, whether high, high resolution studies or low resolution studies. Another very critical aspect to consider is plate flatness. You want your plates to be as close to, to perfectly flat as possible, as close to lambda 100 as possible. Uh, why? Because any defects in the plate flatness 
whether it's real physical defects or apparent defects, as we'll see later, they are going to lower your fitness. So plate flatness is very important, um, both physical plate flatness, as well as taking care of any issues that could affect the apparent flatness of that plate. So as Inkani said, our, uh, our etalons, the medium and uh, low resolution etalons are undergoing refurbishment. So just as a, a general introduction, we have uh, traditionally we've had three etalons on salt, a large gap etalon, medium gap and small gap. These have been used for high, medium and low resolution studies respectively. The small gap etalon is also capable of being operated as a tunable filter in conjunction with the medium resolution and the high resolution modes. Okay, So these are the details um, of the old etalons. However, with the new refurbished system, we are expecting, for example, better resolving power um, and also the FSR to, to, be, to have improved a bit. Uh, in detail, this is what, um, what we're dealing with. So the old system, after several years of usage, uh, the coatings had degraded, um, and this, of course, affects the quality of, of, of the data that you're getting out of here. Your finish is very low. The cells in which, or the housings in which the, the etalons are, are housed, they had also degraded, and this exposed the plates to environmental effects. Also, the mounts were not able to be remotely operable, as well as Due to the intrinsic design of the former coatings, there were phase, phase changes at critical wavelengths. These phase changes, which they are not due to environment or wear and tear, they are simply due to the intrinsic way the, the multi, multi layer dielectric reflective coatings are, they cause phase changes. Um, and this, this, these phase changes are going to impact on the apparent flatness of your plates and that apparent um, defects in the plate flatness is going to lower your finis. So we are expecting that um, the new coating design will minimize the phase changes at critical wavelength. The critical wavelengths I'm talking about, these were wavelengths that were of very high interest to users, to salt users. For example, H alpha and H beta, when you have inflections or phase changes at these wavelengths, then you're not having perfect parallelism, which affects your data. So we are hoping for um, a different, different coating designs for our new etalons, uh, much higher reflectivity, meaning higher uh, reflectance finish. We are, we are also expecting better housing, tight housing, which will protect our etalons against the environment. And this, this not only protects the coatings from degradation, but also helps us to maintain the stability of the parallelism between the plates, as well as the, the deviation of the zero point of wavelength, because with time it can vary slightly, okay? The mounts as well, we are expecting new mounts to enable remote operability. The old mounts used to require manual operability whenever, the, for example, the the parallelism would trip, okay? Someone would have to go there to the manual controller and get things uh, fixed. However, any radio interference um, in the cables would again disturb the stability of the system. So these are the different refurbish refurbishments that we are expecting to come our way. Uh, we are also doing an entire software overhaul to have new wavelength calibration software uh, to maintain that, to keep checking the stability of the parallelism, as well as very critical, the reduction pipeline. One of the things that were discouraging, perhaps discouraging users to, to send in proposals were, were the complex data set that is involved when you're using the fabric payroll mode. So we are building a new data reduction pipeline that will avail the users with end products, which they can easily use to do their science and produce their papers. That way they'll be encouraged to know that they are getting ready to use data. And also the new system will be independent of PySalt and IRF, which is no longer being supported. So Elizabeth, for more information, off, huh? thank you. Right. Yeah. So for more information, you can just look at these links, and that is all I have for you. Thank you very much. Agreed. Uh, thank you.
we now open the floor for uh, any question or comments from uh, first of all the people here in the room if there is any uh okay vanessa hi uh, thank you liz can you hear me sure. yes i can hear So first, the, the first uh, software upgrades that we are doing are with the calibration pipeline. And once we, we finish with the calibration pipeline, we are hoping that by then the, the new etalons will have arrived. Then we will do the science commissioning. That is when the data reduction pipeline will be now established and that will probably begin like at the end of this year when the etalons arrive. For now, because the, the etalons sort of behave differently in the lab and on sky, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's difficult to say that we'll have a reduction pipeline before they come, which anyway will be useless before they come. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. I don't see any other question here in the room and I don't see any question on the on the chat. So I think we should thank again uh, our speaker, Elizabeth, uh, for her talk, isn't it? Should we? We'll go to the next talk, which is actually going from Seoul to uh, to uh, to Mirkat. So where is it? Yeah, so it's here. So Brandon uh, Angel Brecht will be talking about satellite contamination on the Mercat H1IM. So uh, I imagine he's online and he can just start. 12 minutes plus three minutes question and answer. Hello, can you see the screen? Yes, indeed. Okay, cool. Um, hi, my name is Brandon Elder. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of the Western Cape under supervision of Professor Mario Santos. And the work that I'm presenting is the satellite contamination on Meerkat single dish H1 intensity mapping. Now, um, H1 intensity mapping is a relatively novel technique. It uses the neutral hydrogen atom because of the rare spin transition, where the atom goes into a higher order state, releases um, a wavelength of 21 centimeter or 1420 megahertz and moves back down to its neutral state. Now, it's a rare transition, but due to the large abundance of H1 in the universe, uh, we see this going off quite often. And due to the fact that it is a large abundance, it's a good tracer for the large scale structure of the universe. So essentially, it, um, wherever there's a large concentration of H1, there's usually um, a dark matter or large concentrations of galaxies as well. Now, intensity mapping is a means of measuring, instead of measuring the individual galaxies as point um, galaxies, we measure the overall emission from groups of galaxies. And this gives a good 3D representation of the uh, LSS. Um, Elizabeth mentioned in her like uh, cube, it's essentially the same thing. You have your spatial plane and then you have your uh, frequency or redshift plane going back in time. So we sacrifice resolution, but we gain sensitivity when we use this method. And another advantage of this method is that we scan large volumes of the sky relatively quicker. Um, the instrument that we're going to use is Meerkat. And most people know Meerkat as a interferometer, but it can be also used as an autocorrelation or in single dish mode. So essentially each receiver or antenna will look at the same pixel on the sky and improve the sensitivity of that pixel. Uh, the proposed survey for the H1 intensity mapping is called MIR class, the Meerkat Large Area Subnoptic Survey. It's a 4,000 square degree for 4,000 hours. Um, it's 64 dish, uses Meerkat 64 dishes and looks at the L band and UHF band. It's a good um, proposal for the detection of the baryonic acoustic oscillation, which is a standard rule of measurement in the universe. Uh, before the main survey or the proposed survey, there have been a few observations that have already been done um, along with a pilot survey. 
And from there, a paper was produced by my co-supervisor, Dr. Jingying Wong, on the calibration pipeline for H1 intensity mapping with Meerkat. Now, um, these are two images that come out of the paper. The image on your left shows the time averaged uh, signal for multiple observations from one antenna. The shaded regions show the areas of contamination uh, and the unshaded regions are good signal or least amount of contamination. The image on your right shows the calibrated maps. Um, those are the top and at the bottom is the smooth interpolated maps. On the right hand side of that image are the residual maps. Um, so the contamination that I'm referring to is called radio frequency interference. It's essentially man-made interference, such as cell phones, satellites, and airplanes. Um, there are strong sources of, um, of contamination and it interferes with the detection. So on the image, you see um, the first red box is um, more on the lower side of the frequency plane. And this is uh, frequency interference that comes from um, cell phones, airplanes, GSM receivers. The broken box in the middle, the red broken box in the middle is the area of interest for us. And this is um, more of your navigational satellites. Um, that's the interference coming from them. The little green box shows the H1 signal. And the last red box shows um, still navigational satellite interference, but also more of your telecommunication satellite interferences. So the problem with satellites is that they, are, they operate in multiple subbands, and they're also owned by multiple organizations. So they differ from satellite to satellite. So like I said, the satellite that we are interested in is the navigational satellites. They're um, part of six different regions on um, have various navigational constellations. So these are like GPS for United States, GLONASS for Russia, Galileo for Europe, and so on. There's also one augmented constellation, and this essentially assists um, the current navigational satellite systems. So in total, you're looking at about 150 plus satellites that just help with navigation. Um, the problem is that each satellite or each constellation has various signal structures. Um, so they differ between constellation to constellation and signal to signal. So the figure on your left again comes from my co-supervisor's paper. It's essentially a time ordered data plot which shows the time on the y-axis and frequency on the x-axis. The first highlighted red box shows how satellite um, signal comes or represents how satellite signal shows up in the data. Um, the red box also represents the area of interest that we are looking at, about 1,000 to uh, 1,500 megahertz. The pink region shows the uh, satellite contamination, which is predominantly more telecommunication based, um, an area of, that we're not looking at at the moment. The small red box on the color bar just represents where the H1 signal should be, about 0 0.1 millikelvin. And you can see the various, the, the big difference between that and where what the satellite contamination is doing. Then there's also an image of a level one flag. So in the calibration pipeline, there is um, flagging that's done to try and remove as much of the contaminants as possible. And essentially you're removing quite big chunks of data um, to try and alleviate the contamination problem. Then the image on your right, uh, it's essentially showing various signal structures that the satellites have. So as you can see, they, they can differ quite a bit between um, constellation, depending on what kind of signal structure is given to those satellites. So uh, the problem, a big problem with satellites is that you can't really observe with them in the, in the field, but you also can't live without them on the planet. And the problem gets worse when you look at the new mega constellations such as OneWeb and Starlink and Inmarsat that's coming. So they are going to produce hundreds of thousands of satellites. Um, and the, the problem affects both the optical like Vera Rubin and um, radio observations such as Meerkat, 
With Vera, the problem is more of the satellites passing through the sky where Vera is pointing towards, and this leaves um, very bad tracks on the, on, um, the observation. And with radio, you see those spikes um, inside the data. So currently what can be done is mostly RFI flagging, so removing the contamination, but also losing data in the process, or satellite avoidance. So if you know where the satellites will be, um, wait until they're passed before pointing again at that location. And essentially my work is kind of trying to do both of those things. So currently we're developing a Python-based simulation package um, that can track satellites. So here you're seeing um, two constellations. You have GLONASS, which is the Russian-based navigation satellites on your left. And on your right, you have Galileo, which is the European constellation. And you can see that um, for most part, there is two satellites from each constellation that comes into the zero degree mark. So this means it crosses exactly where the telescope is pointing to. So we can identify when a satellite comes very close to so the five degree mark, the black line, or when it actually crosses the, the zero degree mark. And this causes higher contamination effects to be seen in the, in the data. So from this, we're, we're also developing a sort of um, observation window. So if you give the simulation a set of days and time that you would like to observe, and also how long of the observation you're looking at, it would, could map out the, the positions of various constellations on the sky. Um, so you have constellations on the top, uh, days of observations on the y-axis. And then what I've done is I've highlighted um, the various colors. So green represents no uh, satellite contamination coming within five degrees of, of the telescope pointing. Yellow represents um, satellites coming within five degrees. Red represents satellites crossing the zero degree mark, so crossing straight over where the telescope is pointing to. So these are, like, these are some of the things that we're trying to develop inside the simulation. Another thing or more the, the goal of the simulation is to actually model uh, the satellite signal that we see to the data. So these are two time chunks of the time order data, just averaged again down in time. So you're looking at the frequency plane and the model is the cyan curve to the black being our data. And for most part, we get a good overlay of how the satellite contamination would behave on the data. Um, we're still trying to improve this because we see that this is all good for when satellites are a bit further away, but as soon as the satellites cross over um, our, our telescope pointing, there is um, the data becomes very hard to fit for, or the model gets extremely confused by fitting. So for the most part, we can fit pretty well outside of the regions. And for now, we're looking at masking those regions and then just trying to fit for the contamination around the masked areas. Um, so I don't know if I went too quick, but in summary, we have, um, due to the age of the mega constellations, uh, they pose a great nuisance for ground-based optical and radio astronomy. And the improvements of the sensitivity of the telescopes increases throughout the years. And this has resulted in more low-lying RFI being detected. So what we could essentially a few years ago disregard now starts to pose a threat as we get to higher levels of sensitivity. Um, essentially, if we know when um, satellites would appear in our observation windows, we could adjust our observations to fit for that. Um, this is one of the aspects of the simulation that I'm trying to develop. Uh, another thing is just like the ability to, to map the signal effects would also tell you how severe contamination would be. And it could help in improving cleaning, um, such as identifying which channels uh, could harbor 
satellite contamination, especially also low-lying contamination that RFI cleaning methods might miss. Um, one aspect is that this simulation is was first initially built for Meerkat, but I'm trying to make it as general as possible so that it could be utilized by many other um, single dish or maybe even interferometer-based radio telescopes Brandon, such your, as Parks as your well. Your time is off. Brendan, my friend, you, your time is off. Just quickly say the last the point because there's no time for discussion even. Oh, I'm sorry. Just sorry. Quick, wrap up quickly. Very, no, no, very that's it. One last word. No, that, that, that's all actually. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So we help we thanks the our speaker. And, and we allow for one uh, question, possibly one quick question from the room or from uh, from the chat. And uh, myself, I have a short one based on your uh, conclusions. Possibly you mentioned that knowing where and when uh, the satellites could appear, you could uh, observe on a quieter uh, uh, time, uh, time, time, but uh, with the new constellation of satellites could be, is that uh, feasible? I mean, it'd be thousands of things to, to monitor and to try to avoid that at the end we'll have no, no observing time, no quiet time possibly, no? <laughs> so the, the idea for this one was only on the navigation satellite systems. You'd have your observation window box. You could shift the window to a different point just to avoid one satellite coming in. With the mega constellations, I'm not sure how feasible shifting would be, but I haven't looked at the mega constellations as of yet. I know the SKA office, the main office is looking at that. But for Meerkat right now, just the navigation satellites, if you know where they are, you mm. could shift your box around. They are the most noisy, the most noisy one, do you think? For what the the um, area that we are looking at, the frequency range that we are looking at, there are the more noisy ones, yes. Okay. Thank you. Question? Yes, yeah. go ahead. Just one question. Um, you mentioned that the RFI modeling uh, is somehow in nitrate when you when the when the satellite actually passes to when the main pointing of the of the antenna. Um, can you maybe elaborate on that? I don't understand. Uh, usually the signal will be stronger there, and so it would quite fit the model. Is it is it uh, noise that's causing the inaccuracies or the actual model that you're using in the satellite? Very quickly. It's actually just the saturation becomes too heavy for, for Meerkat, uh, so you, that it oversaturates the receiver. So okay. we can't fit for that saturation. Thanks. OK, I don't see any question in the chat, and I think we have exhausted the question in this uh, room. So we'll thank again our speaker. Uh, warm up right. and I think we'll move right away into the next session which is on cosmology we'll change the topic altogether not too much from instrumentation to cosmology I think Paul is that you I see uh yes. see you there right good so Paul yeah. Fallon from UNISA University South of South Africa so that's so now the next uh don't panel again it's on the next uh, session is on as cosmology I'm sorry Brenda is supposed to be the. No, no. no. I am the. Other okay, I am the. Sorry, sorry. Okay, that's fine. I'm not confused. Okay, so just go ahead with your talk. You just share your screen, and you have a uh, twelve minutes plus two minutes for discussion. Hopefully, uh, you can see my screen. Yes, indeed. Okay, so it's not on cosmology as you mentioned, but uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'll be presenting oh, yeah. work on yeah, yeah. calculating C-band Miller matrices for the. Green Bank Radio Telescope. Just want to uh, acknowledge the other authors who were part of this project. So my talk is on the a calibration process. So this is calibrating uh, polarization, polarization signals for single dish radio telescopes. Um, now the polarization properties of uh, radio signals do provide valuable information both about the source and its surrounding uh, region and initially what we intended to do was to measure the polarization properties of a maser we've been tracking for several years and we took the opportunity of submitting a proposal director's discretionary time proposal to the uh, green bank telescope in order to do that 
But our initial proposal was rejected and it was because Green Bank didn't have the calibration parameters to enable an accurate polarization measurement. And those calibration parameters are termed something called the Muller matrix. So this Muller matrix was last determined for, for Green Bank back in 2005, so a while ago. And then subsequent system changes mean that that calibration is no longer relevant. So in order to proceed, we extended our um, proposal to include uh, observation time so we could determine this uh, Muller matrix and included uh, Tom, uh, sorry, Tim Robbie Shaw as one of the participants as he'd done the previous calibration uh, at Green Bank. Just an aside, normally to operate the Green Bank or to use the Green Bank telescope, you're required to do an on-site training process and observations do require you to be, or generally do require you to be on-site. But due to sort of the COVID environment, all of that has moved online and I think making the process a lot easier for us. It just reduced travel and reduced costs. So um, the measurement process uh, of, for the radio signal is, is never perfect. Uh, and you know, what we're trying to do here is uh, get the polarization signal, which is determined uh, by Stokes parameters that's shown on the right here. But the process of measurement, both the, you know, the telescope itself and the whole system, the system comprises of two orthogonal feeds. Now you get two signals coming out of that. Signals here, I'm showing that central schematic are, are labeled X and, and Y. They go through separate electronics. And in, this, you know, in the measurement process, you end up with things such as calibration gain differences, so slight differences of gain come through in X and Y. Uh, you can get phase differences occurring. Simple things such as slight difference in, in cable lengths bring about phase differences. So this all ends up that you actually modify your polarization signal. And the modification of that signal is described by something that's called this Muller matrix. The Muller matrix effectively describes the four by four matrix, describes how the Stokes parameters are modified uh, by your um, instrument. If you have your Muller matrix, the process is quite easy. You can apply the inverse of the Muller matrix to your observed Stokes parameters, and you get your uh, source Stokes parameters, so your source polarization. There's an additional component here. A green Bank is an old azimuth mount telescope. So as it tracks the, the source, uh, it actually rotates as it tracks the source. So you need to bring in uh, this rotation term as well. And that's uh, denoted by that M sky matrix shown in that uh, equation at the bottom. We, um, or our process to uh, actually measure and determine this Muller matrix is the one that was used previously at Green Bank. It was also used at Arecibo and then more recently at FAST. And it's a technique of tracking a linear polarized source as it traverses the sky. We used uh, measurements of, of two separate uh, known polarized sources. So the two calibrators we used is 3C138 shown there and 3C286. The scan or the measurement we did is was called uh, at Green Bank is, is called the spider scan involves several scans across the source it's shown in that schematic uh, on the uh, left and it's normally four scans across the source it gives you eight legs and that's where the name spider comes from if you look at the the graph on the on the right the lower right it just shows you the uh, intensity uh, as you do the scan you're particularly interested in that midpoint so this on source point our objective here was to measure the on source Muller matrix. So the Muller matrix or correction matrix as you're pointing at the source. The other data here was not used by our project, but can be used if you need to map the off axis uh, response. 
Well, once we'd gathered the data, we'd expect uh, analyzing data should be a straightforward process. Data, so that data like this has been analyzed in the, in the past. However, uh, this is not a routine process at green banks. Uh, analysis routines are, are, are not, we're not available for this. So we've had to create our own analysis code and, and programs. In particular, it's calibration of the cross polarization spectra. So you end off uh, out of your instrument with four different spectra, your X and your Y, and then your cross correlation X, Y, and Y, X spectra. We also developed code to be able to analyze you know, all four spectra for frequency switching and position switching observations. And that's shown in that graph on, on the right, just the four spectra for frequency switched observation. Once you have your spectra, you can determine your Stokes parameters. So the process we followed here, we have documented this and uh, that together with this code is now available for other users and it's recorded as part of a, a Green Bank memo. Once you've uh, determined your Stokes parameters, the process to actually calculate this uh, calibration matrix or Miller matrix. It's a case of plotting out your fractional Stokes parameters as a function of the parallactic uh, angle, which is effectively the rotation uh, of the telescope, rotation angle of your telescope. So shown here in orange is the Stokes Q and the gray, the Stokes U. So expect these to be non-zero terms because we're looking at a linear polarized source and you expect them to change as you uh, rotate your, your telescope. But I think what's interesting to point out, your Stokes V parameter shown here in, in green by those uh, uh, green boxes, this, you'd expect this to be zero. Stokes V represents circular polarization. Uh, and the reason why it's non-zero here is effectively that modification of the polarization signal. But that modification is described by uh, these Miller matrix equations. And it's a matter of fitting these observed parameters or fitting the Miller matrix equations to these observed parameters. That fitting process, you can see on the, the graph, ends up producing uh, several different parameters. First five uh, parameters give you the, uh, what you need to determine your Miller matrix. And the final two, give you the uh, last, uh, give you two terms which describe your polarization of your source. We had fairly accurate uh, fitting of our data, uh, particularly the middle of the C band, but frequencies at either end of the, free, uh, the C band had a, a bit more scatter. Now from that process, we were able to determine the Miller matrices for a range of C-band frequencies. Uh, so we achieved the results that we intended. Then looking down at the uh, data on the bottom right, uh, that just shows you the linear polarization results for the two uh, calibrators we looked at, the 3C138 and 3C286. The values that that we calculated are, are shown here, both the linear polarization percentage and angle, with fairly accurate results, uh, and they correspond well with the, the known values for these uh, two sources. But accuracy just does indicate that the measurements uh, uh, worked out well, and we should have accurate Miller matrices or correction matrices. Some other detail that jumped out of this is in the Miller matrices, the cross terms are relatively small. It does indicate limited uh, crosstalk between the X and Y channels, which is what you expect from a fairly uh, well-designed instrument. Uh, we also picked up another thing. It, with the Green Bank uh, measurement process, you can use one, or, one of two calibration noise diodes in order to do your measurement. That's the high cal or the low cal noise diode. We showed that uh, those ca both each calibration noise diode requires a different Willem matrix, something I think that was not uh, previously known and uh, still not sure the reason for that, but uh, 
we were able to at least show that and calculate these different Miller matrices. Also showed that these Miller matrices change with frequency, which is, uh, is, to, is to be expected. So in conclusion, we uh, did achieve what we initially intended to do, which was uh, by applying the Miller matrix correction, which we calculated to the data or the data that we, we uh, collected, we were able to achieve that initial objective, which was obtaining polarization results for the mono two maser. But I think the thing I would like to sort of conclude with and, and point out in this talk, in, in doing this, we not only achieved the, the results that we intended, but we also added value to the Green Bank uh, Observatory. And we were able to calculate these uh, Muller matrices, which are now available for users at uh, Green Bank. And we developed a series of programs for analyzing polarization spectra, which are also available for, for users. So to conclude, no, we can, as uh, astronomers in Africa, uh, utilize these inter international instruments, but can also add value in the process. Uh, we, and uh, just probably a final comment, uh, we've gone through a fairly uh, extensive uh, learning process here, both in terms of operating the Green Bank telescope and uh, also in terms of being able to calculate these calibration matrices. So if there is anyone there who does require uh, support in terms of using the Green Bank uh, telescope uh, or calculating uh, similar correction uh, matrices, uh, we'd be more than willing to help. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we are exactly on time for, and we are, we are in fact have uh, two minutes left, let's say, for the questions uh, about your talk. So I start here from the room. Is there any question to Paul? And we'll check uh, on the chat. Okay, so African, I mean, astronomy can uh, get contribution from this kind of uh, work that you have been carrying on in the Green Bank uh, Observatory. Or what's the, that was your, one of your conclusions. So, great, so we can. Uh... Yeah. No, I think we were trying to point out that no, as. Uh... Astronomers sitting here in Africa, uh, we don't need to confine ourselves just to instruments in Africa. We are okay. both able to use uh, some of the international instruments, but also can add value to those observatories. And I think that that whole process becomes a lot easier uh, as a result of almost this COVID pandemic. I think a lot more is online and uh, interacting with the international observatories becomes a lot easier. Okay, great, uh, great conclusion. I think I don't see any hand waving in any place, so I can just uh, ask you to thank our speaker and we'll move to the next one. So thank you. Our next uh, and last speaker, and not the least one, is a young one, in fact. So is uh, it is Sikelelo. Uh, Sikelelo, yes. So where, where are you? Okay. I'm here. You're here, in my back. Okay, so it's... Um, Go ahead with your talk, 12 minutes plus three. So I'm sorry, it was, it was not on cosmology, this uh, two talks, although the one that we are going to be listening now, it looks like a little bit of cosmology. Go ahead, uh, Tsikelelo. All right. Uh, last presentation just before lunch. Uh, anyway, I'm Tsikelelo Charles, a uh, student at Joyce University. Uh, I have to be, I have to say I'm funded by Sarawo, uh, under the supervision of Professor Oleg Sminov, Prof. Gianni Bernardi, and Dr. Ladman Besta. Today I'll be sharing with you uh, part of my master's project which is basically simulations of the primary beam effects of, on the cosmic bispectrum phase observed with the hydrogen epoch of ionization. It's quite a descriptive title, um, but you don't have to worry about that. So what I will be doing today, uh, basically reviewing a little bit on the big, model, big Bang model that will feed into the epoch of ionization. 
uh, briefly describe the hyper, hyperfine transition. I think we know that by now. And also uh, talk about what we know as the foreground, foreground as a problem for especially EOR experiments. And how do we deal with this? Um, the main, main um, approach is, used, is to use the delay uh, spectrum approach. And my project is specifically looking at the closure way uh, of, of, uh, uh, detect, of uh, actually studying the EOR period. Uh, but primarily, I'll be looking at primary beam effects, and then I'll show you the results and conclude. Anyway, in a nutshell, so the universe, uh, as proposed uh, by cosmologists, I'm not really a cosmologist myself, uh, started off as a single point and eventually expanded. But the whole, entire universe was too hot. Uh, for any neutral uh, elements to form. So everything was completely ionized, and that's the CMB that we see there. But eventually it cooled enough, you know, eventually um, cooled enough that uh, neutral hydrogen started forming uh, and some traces of uh, more like lighter elements like helium. Uh, eventually, again, I won't get into the details, uh, due to, again, the inhomogeneity of the space, everything started collapsing together, and that's, you know, the story as it goes that you started forming stars and so what you see here eventually they started heating firstly when the stars formed uh, started heating the intergalactic medium which is composed of hydrogen initially and eventually uh, as you know get more energetic star formation everything got ionized and eventually which is the universe that we see today is that the intergalactic medium is ionized so the focus of this project is actually study how this actually occurred that is the reionization by these um, galaxies that were newly formed and so as i've said uh, mostly the universe in these early stages was composed of hydrogen so it so happens on so on going to the details that if you give hydrogen enough energy to, it can undergo a transition which we call hyperfine transition so it moves from a lower ground state to a higher ground state and eventually you know if everything uh, prefers a lower ground state so it will emit a uh, a hyper a a, a an electromagnetic wave with a with a uh, wavelength of about 21 centimeters. And so how do we study this period? Okay, so we, uh, firstly, um, so we actually, what we, what we look at, what we measure with our instrument is, is not the actual signal, the, the H1 from the epoch of ionization, but it's rather the contrast, that is the difference between the temperature of the CMB and whatever is in the, uh, the path from there. So over here, I'm just showing the difference between that. And you can see in, you, during the early universe in the dark ages, uh, everything is more or less in red. So that means, you know, um, CMB was the highest, was, there, was, was very bright then. But eventually, um, things equated. So if you look at zero where you have black, the black line, that means there isn't any um, uh, difference between the temperature of the hyperfine transition and the cosmic uh, and the uh, CMB. But eventually uh, the stars started heating up the gas and now you, the gas was extremely hot, more than the CMB. And eventually everything got, part of it got ionized. That's just what you see in the blue end. Eventually the whole, the entire universe um, uh, was ionized. So you can do this. You can actually um, measure this uh, with, with, with an interferometry. This is like a global uh, average temperature. Uh, but there, 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 there are two ways, so you can do it this way, or you can look at something that we call the power spectrum, but I think I'll discuss that later on. All right, so let's talk about the foreground problem. As you know, the signal that we're looking for is during the EOR, so it's quite far from, uh, it's quite far from Earth, I would, I would say, and it's quite weak. Um, so it's about five millikelvin, but in the way the extragalactic sources, and you also have, you know, uh, I think everyone has emphasized that, you know, as much as we love our Milky Way galaxy, the, it causes a bit of problem. So we have the galactic emission uh, from the foreground, which is extremely brighter than the actual signal that we're looking for. And obviously, we need to peel these things off. Um, before I get into that, um, let's briefly talk about um, the visibilities that are measured by interferometry. Basically, an interferometer measures a visibility, which is kind of related to the sky sky brightness. Um, and so, what we usually do with the, we'll correlate the two signals. I think everyone by now actually know what what, what this what what this is. So, an interferometer an interferometer 
um, that is in this case, the two, two element differential measures of visibility baseline. We're not interested in the imaging in this project. Um, we're just interested in the visibility. So what is showing here, this is not actually from mine, it's from a different person. What you see over there, uh, the cyan and the blue and the red, although all those are the foreground signals, and the signal of interest is, 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 is shown in gray. And you can see that spectrally, they are quite different. Um, the foregrounds are quite smooth spectrally, like uh, uh, smooth, and then the H1 signal varies, varies quite rapidly. And hence the motivation to separate them in a Fourier space. So uh, if you did some Fourier space, you would know that uh, uh, as, as soon as the signal varies rapidly, then it, it populates the higher, higher modes. But that's the ideal case. But however, with real in instruments, uh, you never actually quite measure um, the, the smoothness of the foreground. So they're really corrupted. So what you have there at the top, that's the signal that you get from the sky again. Uh, but eventually there are some uh, effects that, you know, um, the, that the signal gets as it, it's coming. Okay, so there might be interference with the uh, ionosphere. Also, something that we call the, uh, a direction dependent effect, which is primary in this case, the, 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 the pointing direction of, of the antenna, uh, sensitivity pattern of the antenna. And there are also other effects such as, you know, when you get the signal, you need to amplify it and uh, do a whole lot of things to it. Uh, and so these, those are normally called direction independent effects, you know, that you actually put into the signal to amplify. So eventually when you want to get the true brightness, you need to correct for all of these things. So never, every, everything is never ideal. In the process of doing this, uh, uh, of trying to actually calibrate um, your, your instrument, you end up now changing the spectral nature of the foregrounds. And what you see here, so this space, this is like in a different, uh, this is uh, the power spectrum, it's different space. Uh, and basically you would find that the foregrounds are almost kept here at this lower wedge. And then your 21 centimeter signal, you would expect it to be there. But you can see here, theoretically, all the foregrounds are supposed to be below this white line. However, due to, again, the, 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 the instrumental response, uh, some of the foreground emission is actually flowing into these higher uh, K modes. And, that's, and, 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 and we can't do anything about it. You can model it, uh, good luck with that, but uh, you know, the, the, <laughs> there are various ways you can do it, but sometimes uh, models, accurate models don't really exist. Um, or at least in this in this field. Uh, so some of the emission is thrown there. And so what we do is, oh, right. And so to measure this power spectrum, so there's been some progress, uh, some H1 uh, uh, experiments, uh, and they've managed to, to you know, get closer to, so this is a power spectrum. And these are all results from different experiments on, on the custom, but we actually need to get down here in order to dis discriminate between different types of models. So the various models, again, describing the, the exact same period, but now we haven't gotten there yet. And so in essence, most of them are noise limited. Some of them are, are limited by systematics, but here's a way to deal with the problem. So this is using what we call the, the, the closure phase, which is derived from the bispectrum. So instead of taking the visibilities by themselves, we rather multiply them to form what we call the bispectrum. And when we do this, uh, so that's, that's what you can, we can express now the visibilities. If you see here the gains, uh, so that's the true sky signal that you get. But then again, as I've emphasized that, you know, you kind of amplify the gain and you do all sorts of things. So that changes the true signal so we can model that. Uh, at least, so note here, these are only the uh, uh, um, corruptions associated with the antenna, okay? And so if you form this, uh, and again, using that, that logic, uh, you can see that if you multiply the three visibilities together, we get rid of any phase information from the antenna. As a result, whatever phase that we get from the bispectrum is actually the true sky signal. So we've done, we've dealt with one problem, which is, you know, the, the, the gains associated with, with, with the antenna, but now, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, yes. And if you, if you do it the closure, way, closure phase way again, um, just to show that, you know, the method actually works. So uh, first person to do this was Nithya, performed some simulation. So what you see again here, those are the foregrounds and again, the, the 21 centimeter signal, and you separate them in this Fourier space. And basically uh, at various redshifts, I don't wanna discuss uh, that now, but at this redshift, um, 
7.1, he was able to see that you can actually get a separation of the order of uh, five. So what you see over there, that's the foregrounds, including the 21 centimeter signal. But if you have the foregrounds only, that's the green curve. So you can actually separate them. But of course, not that these lower K modes, but that is uh, higher K modes. So we can do this just as, just as the delay spectrum guys are doing it. But luckily for us, we don't have to do any calibration uh, to first instance. But, okay. All right, thank you. Uh, so the pr primary beams, uh, however, yeah, sorry, uh, the signal is affected by primary beams. And what we have, this is a sen sensitivity pattern. And basically the difference is that uh, with HERA, we get a lot of mutual coupling signals bouncing from each, an each antenna. And this introduces these variations on the side lobes. Sometimes you don't have to worry about them, but in this case you do. Uh, again, they corrupt the foreground. So I won't get into this now uh, since I have to conclude. Uh, so we simulated like basically three pointings. And the difference between this, this is a cold sky emission, and as you expect, as soon as you approach the, the galactic plane, things are going to, you know, not be great for you. So over here, that's, a, that's what you would get with an ideal beam that is without the mutual coupling, but over here, the, all the stuff with the mutual coupling, so it bleeds uh, in emission. And so with this project, uh, we were able to show that, yes, if you point in a terrible uh, pointing, then uh, things are really going to get bad, but however, we were able to find that not all the fields are necessarily bad. Sometimes this mutual coupling effect can be avo avoidable. Thank you. Uh, this is summarized in a wow. recently released paper, wow. uh, 15 March. Wow. And you're a master student? Uh, I'm a second year PhD student. Sorry, sorry, I got, I got it wrong. So, indeed. So, you are pretty much an advance in your. I mean, publishing a paper in the second year, that's great. So we open the floor for discussion. Oh okay, yeah, so there was, there was a slide where you had uh, progress of the power spectrum. Uh, and you had, uh, I don't know if it was observations by various instruments. And, you yeah. got your, and then you got your initial 21 centimeter model there. Mm -hmm. If you remember a few years back, there was a detection by the edges experiment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does the results by the edges experiment come close to the physics that's being described by any of the models that came out for, for, for from any of those experiments uh yes so there was there was a, uh, i said yes as in, okay i'm gonna respond yeah. <laughs> uh uh there were a couple of discrepancies between the edges results i mean the, right. the absorption pressure that they that they yeah. actually detected was you know out of, out of, out of the current models and people are looking into it so I myself am not a very uh, good person to ask about this, but uh, they were able to rule out some 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 models, but I don't think they actually ruled out this one. People are rather looking at whether the analysis by the edges guys was. Uh, right. So I know that they, they suspect that there were some systematics with, yes. with, 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 that that could have contributed to the signal that was detected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but, but, but but what I'm just wondering is if. If if any of those models could be close to to, yeah. I, to the physics that that that's predicted by, 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 yeah. by, by, by so yeah okay uh, yeah that, that's a, that's a good question yeah <laughs> okay I don't see any hand uh, raised so I think we can conclude and we thank you again All right. thank you. Uh, for this uh, encouraging uh, result and uh, <laughs> okay <laughs> and we have closed and we have finished the session now. And the next session will be uh, for the people who are online. It will be like, according to the program. How uh, much of the area? It will be uh, then uh, supposedly after lunch. Now that will be uh, at one. Uh, at the one time after lunch remains the same. Sorry. Sorry. The time after lunch remains the same. So.